Hey, Pastor Rob here. Just wanted to thank you for checking out our messages online and wanted to encourage you. I pray that your soul is nourished through the hearing of the word. But at the same time, the writer of Hebrews is very clear about uh, not giving up meeting together. Don't give up the larger gathering. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, the early church made it a point to meet together almost daily even, breaking bread together, encouraging one another, being in communion with one another to build each other up. And, and that is vitally important to your spiritual walk. So I pray that you enjoy this message. But at the same time, I pray that you find a great church body to be a part of, whether that be here at the bridge or somewhere else, so that you can be built up as well. Thank you and God bless. Well, this morning uh, we're in week two of this series called Gaining by Losing, and we're going to start the message today talking about something that is really, really difficult for me to talk about because uh, I, just, I just can't stand even mentioning the topic. But this morning I want to talk to you all about a man named Tom Brady, okay? <laughs> I want to talk to you about, I can hear the grimaces in the room. You're like, no, Rob, we don't want to talk about Tom Brady. Um, I think it's, it's fair to say that, that Tom Brady's the Michael Jordan of football, wouldn't you say? Like he is, he's just that guy. Even if you don't know the sport, you probably know who he is. Um, I'm not sure whether to describe him as the most hated or respected quarterback in all of uh, uh, NFL history, uh, but I'll, I'll be honest with you this morning, he's a man that I love to hate. He's a man that I love to hate, okay? And, okay, maybe, maybe I don't hate him. I'd be lying to, if I didn't say to you, though, that at times I just despise his successes. Like, they just make me sick, mostly because he's not a Packer. Like, if he was a Green Bay Packer, he'd be all good, but he's not. And, and I, think, I think that most of us are football, that are football fans, as much as it would pain us to say it, right? As much as it might pain us to say it, we would say that, man, Tom Brady, he, he's the GOAT, right? He is the greatest of all time. I really believe that. I mean, he, I, I struggled with it until he won his sixth ring. And then I was like, well, now we got to own it. We just don't got to, we don't have a choice. What, what, what makes him the GOAT? Well, let me tell you, earlier this week, I actually Googled all of Tom Brady's records. Let me tell you why he's the GOAT. He's the GOAT because he has the most regular season wins by a starting quarterback. He has the most passing yards, regular season and playoffs. He has the most passing touchdowns, postseason included. Most touchdowns thrown to different receivers. He has 16 division titles, 30 playoff wins. He started in 40 playoff games. He has 73 touchdown passes, 11,179 playoff passing yards. He's appeared in the Super Bowl nine times. He's won six of them. He has four Super Bowl MVPs, and he's got 18 Super Bowl touchdown passes. And finally, he has 2,838 Super Bowl passing yards, all of which he holds the records for. As hard as it may be to admit, Tom Brady's probably the GOAT. And his story is incredible. I, mean, I don't know if you've ever heard Tom Brady's story, but his story's pretty incredible. When Tom Brady was drafted, he wasn't on anyone's radar. I mean, he was just not on anyone's radar. As a matter of fact, until he got to his first start as a Patriot, Tom was never on anyone's radar. In high school, I looked it up, he said he wasn't even just the backup to his freshman football team, he was the backup to the backup. That team would go 0-8 that year, his very first year playing football, but he loved the game so much, he kept going, and he ended up turning that program around. But then, as he was looking to go into college, he was still not on anyone's radar. As a matter of fact, his, it, one article said that his dad had to market him to schools that he might be able to get a scholarship. Eventually, he would go to the University of Michigan, and even during his time at Michigan, uh, during his senior year, uh, people were begging the coach to start another guy that was behind him named Drew Hansen. I mean, Tom Brady was on no one's radar. Not only that, even through the NFL draft, he wasn't drafted until the sixth round. 199th overall, he was drafted. When Tom Brady was talking to a reporter about this, he was quoted, you know, if you do the math, that means that I was passed over by every team in the NFL between four and six times. Holy cow. That is the, that is the story, the backstory of the, probably the greatest quarterback to ever live. I mean, that's just crazy, right? Like how many people, how, how was it possible that that many people missed him? How is it possible that that many people passed over him and just didn't see it? 
I think that's incredible, but, but here's the thing. I don't even think that's what's most incredible about Tom Brady. It's not his records, it's not his, his story, but really what I find most incredible, I found out when I was about 13 years old, when I was about 13 years old, Tom Brady had won his third uh, 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 ring in four years, his third Super Bowl ring in four years, and uh, he was one of the most famous people on the planet at that time. Not Maybe not as famous as he is now, but he was definitely a big deal. One reporter called him the most eligible bachelor in all the world, okay? Uh, as a matter of fact, that was right before he met Giselle, so he was definitely eligible. And, uh, uh, as, as the, but, but what amazed me was what he said in the interview when uh, I was watching him on 60 Minutes with my dad, okay? 60 Minutes, my dad's boring, all right? I don't know how he watches that show. But we were watching 60 Minutes together, and uh, when I was 13 years old, the, the reporter looked at him and he said, you're the most, you've got three rings, you're at the top of your game, you're at the top of the world, what next? And this is what Tom Brady said. He said, well, why do I have, I ask myself, why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey man, this is what it is, you've reached your goal, you, 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 your, your dream, you know, your life is, me, he said, this is Tom Brady, he said, me? I think it's gotta be more than this. I mean, it's, it's gotta be more than this. Today, like I said, we're in week two of a series called Gaining by Losing. And last week, we kicked off the series by attempting to shift our thinking as a church. You see, what we realized, what we realized as we attempted to shift our thinking is that for too long, churches have viewed their mission in the wrong way. We viewed the mission in, a long, in the wrong way. Too many churches, especially those that we might consider to be healthy churches, spend a lot of time thinking about the gathering. They're just thinking about Sunday morning. It's about getting people in the building. If we can just be a church that gathers and collects and grows within its own walls, then we will have succeeded. And, and, and we've, we've, we've gone so crazy about this idea of the gathering that we've created these crazy Sunday morning gatherings. We've created these Sunday morning gatherings, uh, and we've even created gatherings throughout the week that are full of light shows and awesome music and time-sensitive, clever communicators, and, and we've built children's programs that are awesome and, 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 and interactive, and we put a lot of focus on this idea of come and see. We put a lot of focus on this idea of just, just come and see. Come and see what's going on. Come check out the gathering. You need to come. You need to come check it out. See what's going on at this church or that church. And it's all been about how many people we as churches can gather and collect. Now, don't get me wrong. The gathering is important. The gathering is very important. In the book of Acts chapter two, we actually, we're gonna visit that in a little bit here. We see that the early church met in the temple courts daily. I mean, they met in the temple courts every single day. But then, even on, later on in, in the book of Hebrews, we see the writer of Hebrews say, man, don't give up gathering together. Don't give up gathering together. It's so important that you gather together. But the problem, I fear, is that many of us have made the gathering the focus and the motive rather than Jesus. Let me say that again. Many of us have made the gathering the focus and the motive rather than Jesus. And instead of creating followers of Christ, we've created followers of pastors and followers of churches. And we found ourselves in the midst of consumers rather than Christians. And what we realized last week is that God never intended that. That was never God's intention for the church. As a matter of fact, God is a sending God. He's always been a God that sends rather than collects. Jesus' first words to the disciples in Matthew chapter 4 were, Come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus' first words to his disciples were, come follow me that I might send you out. God has always been ascending God. It was, as a matter of fact, just before Jesus' ascension, these were his last words. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending 
you. And so last week as we tried to begin to shift our thinking, we asked you one question that we're gonna be asking every single week throughout this series, and that question is this. Who's your one? Who's that one person that you know doesn't know Jesus and doesn't have a relationship with him that, that you're going after? That you know it would change their lives forever if they just came to a personal relationship with them. And some of you guys, I'm gonna be honest with you, some of you might be here today because you are someone's one. Like, I'm just gonna be straight with you. We are a church that is all about finding and helping people, sharing the freedom that God's given us because we can't keep it to ourselves. Amen, church? Amen. We cannot keep it to ourselves. God's given us a peace and a joy and a life that, that transcends all understanding and we can't possibly keep it to ourselves. So now we're starting to ask ourselves, man, who's my one? We've asked God, hey, Lord, Lord, who's my one? Who's that person I should be going after? That person that, that's local, that person that I'm doing life with regularly, and that person that I have to be willing to drop everything for because Jesus dropped everything for me, amen? Who's that person? Who's your one? What can you do to be sent for the mission? God was ascending God. And we as a church are called to meet that we rise up and be sent. God, God wants you to be, he wants to use you to not just add to his kingdom, but to multiply his kingdom. He wants to send you into the mission field. Heck, honestly, he's already sent you into the mission field. Do me a favor for a second. Let me just ask you a question. I want you to raise your hand as high as you can if you would say, you know what, Rob? Every day I go to work, I hang out with non-Christians. Raise your hand. Just let me see it right now. Come on. Every day I go to work, I hang out with non-Christians. I'm around non-Christians. Leave them up. Leave them up. Everybody look around. Everybody look around. Look at all the hands. Look at all the hands. All right? Every single day that I go to work, I hang out with non-Christians. He's already sent you. He's already sent sent you. The question is whether or not you're influencing the field for the harvest or just falling in line among the rows. Let me ask that again. Let, 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 me, let me say that again. The question is whether or not you are influencing the field for the harvest or simply falling in line among the rows. Well, today I want to continue in this idea of becoming a church that sends by talking about that more that I believe that we're all called to. Because we are all called to more than, than we realize. But, but few of us truly experience it because of a lie that we've facilitated as Christians and churches. It's a lie that has been perpetuated for what I believe to be hundreds of years, especially over the last 20 to 30 years, as we've seen the consumer Christian epidemic um, uh, almost peak in that same amount of time. You see, consumer Christians are those Christians that see church like it's a cruise liner, okay? Consumer Christians are those that look at churches like cruise liners. Well, I show up, and, and, and the first question I ask is, well, how is their children's department? And do I like the music? And do I like this? And do I like that? And, 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 and we just come into this idea right when we walk in the doors is that, hey, this whole Christian thing, it's all for me. It's all about me. It will always be about me. And if I'm honest with you, if I'm absolutely honest with you, these are the worst types of Christians, these are the worst types of Christians. And what's ironic, and what I think we all have to realize, and, and, and really we as churches have to own up to, is the fact that we, the church, created the consumer Christian. Do you realize that? Like what's hit me so hard is that we, the church, have created the consumer Christian. We create and encourage the consumer Christian whenever we, whenever we people please, whenever we placate, whenever we compromise. We create the, and encourage the consumer Christian whenever we have multiple kinds of services to cater to, to certain groups of people. We create and encourage the consumer Christian whenever we spend more time thinking about how to cleverly word a message or preach a series or put together a service that will draw people in, in masses rather than please God and, and hold fast to his word and his will and his ways. We create and encourage the consumer Christian as a church. And in doing so, we've allowed people to turn Jesus into a life coach instead of a Lord and master. We've turned Jesus into some kind of a life coach. In doing so, we've facilitated the idea that worship is about you rather than God. 
You know what Francis Chan said when someone came up to him and, and said, hey, I really didn't like, I, wasn't, I didn't really like worship today. Francis Chan said, that's okay, it wasn't about you. We weren't singing to you, is what he said. In doing so, we facilitated the idea that worship's about you rather than God. In doing so, we've allowed people to sit back and, and, and be entertained rather than get up and be challenged and convicted toward life change. In doing so, we've allowed people to believe that the Christian life isn't about self-denial, but it's about living your best life. That God might give you all of your heart's desires like a genie in a bottle. But that's not what the Christian life's about. And that's not even the worst of it. The worst of it is that in doing so, we've facilitated this huge lie that I believe has absolutely crippled the impact of the church in our society. Are you ready? Are you ready for the lie? Here it is. We've facilitated this idea that while pastors and preachers get a calling, the rest of us get to volunteer. Let me say that again. We've facilitated this lie that while pastors and preachers get a calling, the rest of us get to volunteer. J.D. Greer, the guy who wrote the book, Gaining by Losing, said it this way. He said, there is a widespread myth in the church that calling into ministry is a secondary experience that happens to only a few privileged Christians. We believe that God takes the spiritual elite and entrust them with the ministry, and for everyone else, well, everyone else, their duty is to show up and faithfully at the events planned by the ministers, and their job is just to foot the bills. Few lies, he writes, few lies cripple the mission more than that one. We bought into this idea that we just need to show up rather than give up anything. We believe this lie that while pastors have a special calling to lead, the rest of us are just pawns to be moved on the chessboard wherever we're needed. We've given into this mindset that as, as long as we pay our tithes and do our time in a program or ministry in the church, then we're good. And here's the worst part. As we dive into this lie, we're left wondering, like our good, good old friend Tom Brady, I truly believe this. We're all left wondering, man, there's got to be something more than this. Like the Christian life, it, it's got to be more than this. And the worst part is, is that in North America, we facilitated this lie. But, but that's not how the early church began. That's not how it began. The early church took off like a rocket ship after Jesus' ascension. And today, instead of catering to this idea, I want us to debunk this lie. I want us to debunk this lie as we look at the history of the early church. That's what the book of Acts is. The book of Acts is a historical account of the early church written by a man named Luke. And today I want to dig into the book of Acts that we all might realize the history of exactly how the early church began. And then together we're going to discover who it was that helped launch the church and make it truly multiply for the very first time. So if you have your Bibles with you, I want to encourage you to go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. That's where we're going to be at this morning. If you don't have a Bible with you or you don't have an app for that on your phone, uh, go ahead and grab one of the chair Bibles from the chair racks in front of you. I know some of the, rack, the chair racks are missing some Bibles, but uh, if, you can, if you can find one, it would be awesome for you to grab one. We're going to be in Acts chapter 8 this morning. I'm going to let you turn there now. If you don't know how to get there, let me help you. The book of Acts is about two-thirds or three-quarters of the way into your Bible. You'll probably hit Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and then you should hit... Acts. There you go. Somebody, one person got it. Okay. We should hit Acts. Okay. Uh, if you've hit Romans, you have gone too far. Okay. As you turn there, uh, I want to kind of give you a rundown of the first seven chapters of Acts because this is, this morning's kind of a history lesson. So for those of you that hated history class, I'm really sorry. Uh, but uh, in order for us to truly appreciate what's going to happen in Acts chapter 8, though, we have to run through Acts chapters 1 through 7. So um, starting in Acts chapter 1, um, we see Luke give a little bit of a review uh, of the end of Jesus' life on earth. Because the guy named Luke that wrote the book of Acts also wrote the book of 
Luke, yeah, it's not rocket science. You're going to figure it out, okay? Luke, he wrote the book of Luke. And uh, he writes these accounts to the church to a man named Theophilus. Okay? And he picks things up uh, where he left them off in the book of Luke, or his account, uh, his, Luke's account, after Jesus' ministry on earth um, w- was complete, and he suffered and died and rose again and showed himself to the disciples again just before his ascension. He tells them to wait. Jesus tells them to wait. Wait for the Holy Spirit, he said. Don't leave Jerusalem. Just wait for the Spirit. Now, this is kind of a side lesson for you this morning, okay? Here's a little side note lesson for you. Any work that you do in the name of the church without the Holy Spirit is pointless. Do you hear me? This is why we pray before we do, amen? This is why it's so important that we ask God to step into every situation. This is why I pray before every, every time I get up to speak here. Because I know that what I say and what I do will be pointless without God's spirit in me. Amen? So, Jesus says, wait. And his words after that, I think, are really profound. And we're going to find out why in a second here. But in Acts chapter 1, he says this. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. If you're willing to wait, you're going to receive some power that you won't even begin to realize until you've experienced it. And you then will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I want you to remember that. You will be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After that, Jesus leaves. And not long after his ascension, the Holy Spirit does come down on them as promised. In Acts chapter 2, Luke describes the day when the Holy Spirit came down on them. The day that we, were, that we, we call as Christians the day of, does anybody know? Pentecost. The day of Pentecost. And he describes after the Holy Spirit comes down, as the apostles sit together, and as they fast together, and as they pray together in what we know as the upper room, Luke writes that, In Acts chapter 2, suddenly a sound like a violent wind from heaven came and filled the house where they were sitting. It was this huge commotion where all of these crazy things started happening. And tongues of fire came down and rested on on the apostles. And some of us that are skeptics are going, man, that must have been nuts, right? That must have been crazy. And then miraculously, all of the apostles began speaking in different tongues and different languages out of nowhere. After all this commotion happened, a crowd gathered around the house to see what happened. And as they observed the apostles speaking a number of different languages, all at once, some people were amazed, some people thought they were crazy, and other people actually thought they were just drunk. They just thought they were drunk. And they just, they they, they laughed at them, and they turned away, and they walked away. But then Peter, Peter, probably the boldest apostle of them all, continued in his character, and Peter began to step out in the Spirit, and he began to preach the message, the very first message of all messages that would be preached over the next 2,000 years. Could you imagine being a fly on the wall in that moment? I mean, how would you like to be known as the guy that preached the first message about Jesus ever since his ascension. Peter would preach a message that would set the tone for trillions of messages for thousands of years to come. And it was incredible. After which, many of would, uh, would come to believe in the message of Christ and they would immediately be baptized. And near the, the end of Acts chapter 2, we see the first church gathering. In Acts chapter 2, we see the first church, church, church gathering. Check this out. This is what it says they did after they were all baptized, and literally thousands of people were saved. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need every day. How many days? Every day. They continued to meet together in the temple courts. Some of us can't make it every Sunday. They did it every day. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with God, enjoying the favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily. He added to their number daily those who were being saved. 
You may not know this, but this is why we do life groups at the bridge. Life groups are, are gr small groups of people that meet in homes, that pour over God's word each and every week, that, that break bread together, have meals together. Man, if you're not in a life group, you need to grab a green card at the Welcome Center or next to the, to the sound booth, and you need to get plugged in, man. Get in a life group. That's what the early church did, and that's what you should be doing as well. But they met together in their homes, breaking bread together and, and living for one another. We meet in each other's homes each week in life groups, breaking bread, pouring over the apostles' teaching, serving each other, caring for one another, giving to each other as much as we can. This should be done by every believer. But then, over the next few chapters of the book of Acts, as we read, we see the church continue to grow. Numbers are being added to them daily, and it's gotten to the point where the, the apostles can't handle it. Like, they cannot possibly do this on their own. So they start raising up leaders and, and, and they might be able to delegate ministry and, and, and responsibility and authority over the church and the people. And what's kind of jarring is that one of the guys that they appoint to be a leader in the church is a guy named Stephen. And what's so jarring about Stephen's story is almost immediately after he was raised up to be a deacon or an elder or someone to oversee the church, Stephen would then be killed. He'd have his life taken for his faith almost immediately thereafter in chapter 7. And in chapter 8, we see this huge shift. In chapter 8, we see this huge shift. You see, after Stephen is persecuted and tried for his faith, he's stoned to death in his ministry for Jesus. And afterwards, the early church, this brand new gathering, begins to truly experience persecution for the first time because they didn't just want to kill Stephen, they wanted to kill all the Christians. And they begin to experience this persecution for the first time. And chapter 8 is where we see the culmination of Jesus' first call to the disciples in, in Acts chapter 1, where he says, you will be my, ministry, my witnesses in all Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Check this out, Acts chapter 8. We're going to finally dig in now. In Acts chapter 8, after Saul, who we know as Paul, persecuted Stephen and killed him, this is what it says. And Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered. Let me read that again. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Paul began to destroy the church. Saul, excuse me, began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. And this is where it gets really good. Verse 4. Those who had been scattered, those who weren't apostles, those who weren't pastors or preachers or teachers or worship leaders or children's directors or church administrators, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Did you catch what happened there? Jesus, in Acts chapter 1, told the disciples that they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And during the time of their very first persecution, a scattering took place. And who was scattered? All except the apostles. Like I said, in our day, it would be like all except the pastors and the preachers and the teachers. Everyone except the children's directors and worship leaders and church administrators. Everyone except the life group leaders and deacons and elders. Ordinary people scattered across the region. And those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. You know what I think is so profound that I fear so many of us miss? Earlier when I asked many of you how many of you worked every day with non-Christians? When I asked you to raise your hand, I, I didn't get to raise my own hand. If you work with non-Christians on a daily basis, raise your hand. That was the question I asked. Maybe you noticed, but I didn't raise my hand. 
I, we, don't, we don't have any non-Christians on the payroll here at the bridge. Which begs the question, who's better positioned to minister the gospel to the world? You. Who's better positioned to take the hope and the light and the ministry of Jesus to the world? You. The early church, God didn't use the apostles to spread the gospel as much as you might have thought. He used the people. Which eliminates this idea that it's only the pastor's job to connect people to God. As a matter of fact, in the book of Ephesians, we see Paul affirm this idea when he writes this. He says, so Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip them for what? The works of service. To do the work of ministry so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Paul affirms that the people that are, are, are called to do the work of ministry. Now, that's not an excuse for pastors, right? I didn't get to raise my hand because I got to go out in the community. I got to go volunteer to hang out with non-Christians, right? I got I to figure out creative ways to get out there. And I do do that. I'm telling you, I'm not asking you to do anything that I'm not doing myself. And it doesn't excuse us. I just think that Paul understood that God positioned his people with specific place, in specific places with specific giftings and specific personalities to reach the world in their own specific way. Let me say it a different way. I just think that Paul understood that God placed you in specific places with specific giftings, specific personality traits that you might reach his people, those that are lost, in your own specific way. Which brings us to our application for today. Okay, this is my, so what, Rob? Now what are we going to do, right? Let me ask you this question. Uh, did you know that the English word for, the, for vocation actually stems from the Latin, and it actually means to call? The English word for vocation is derived from the Latin word voca, meaning to call. The reformers, church reformers, saw our vocations, uh, whether secular or sacred, as callings by God to, ex to assist in his care for the earth. J.D. Greer points out that Adam wasn't created to be a park ranger, but rather he was created to be a gardener. While a park ranger simply preserves the land, the gardener develops it and cultivates it, cultivates it and grows it. Martin Luther, one of our church fathers, the man who pioneered the idea of placing the gospel back in the people's hands, said this. He said, our secular vocations are like masks God wears in caring for the world. When we pray, for the, Lord, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we ask God to give us our day, this day our daily bread. And how does God answer that prayer? Well, God answers that prayer by the farmer who planted it and harvested the grain. The baker who made the flour into bread, the person who prepared our meal, all these are in play when God answers our prayer for daily bread. Some of you this morning might be sitting there thinking, I don't even know where to start, Rob. Like, Rob, I, I don't even know how to share my faith. I don't know where to begin. I, Rob, I don't know how to find time to do this. Rob, I don't even know, I, I don't even think I have enough knowledge to do something like that, to share the gospel, to, to share what God's done in my life with someone else, and, and to be able to educate them in his word. And I'm here to tell you now that, that we're going to help you do that over these next few weeks, but I also think we overcomplicate it. I also think that, that if you're willing to just listen and step out in courage and ask God to use you, that he will. I'm here to tell you that now that if, if, if you're going to, if we're going to help you with all of those things, if you're willing to grow in them, we want to help you. But just like last week, I think we have to start small in this area. We do. Last week we started small. We said we want to be a church that multiplies, but we're going to start with our one. I, 
I think that, that understanding what we're called to do and what we're called to become uh, starts with one simple thing, and all you have to do is pay attention to your positioning. This isn't in the outlines, unfortunately. It didn't make it in there, so I would encourage you to write it in, but I want you to begin to pay attention to your positioning. Where has God positioned you? Where has God placed you? Where has God already placed you, and how can you strategically use that for the mission of connecting people to him? God is not asking you to do more. Being a Christian is not ad about adding more to your life. It's about integrating everything that you believe into everything that you are and everything that you do. Amen? Amen. Christian is not something extra. Christian is not, hey, Sunday mornings. Christian is not about the holy sacraments. Christian is about a lifestyle that is following and running after Jesus as hard as we can with everything we can. Amen? And my question to you is, why, what are you doing to integrate the mission into your natural rhythms of life? Into the giftings and rhythms that God has created you for? Ask yourself these questions. What skill has God given me which I can bless the world? How has he already created me? What have I already learned? What am I already doing? How can I use that for the advantage of the mission? And then ask yourself, where and how can I do it most strategically to advance the mission of God? Man, God, God wants to use you, but he can't use you if you're not willing to step up and go, well, I want to be used Lord, I realize I'm already in the mission field. What do I got to do to start utilizing that for your kingdom? God blesses us so that we can bless others. What's your positioning? Where has God placed you? How can you leverage that for his kingdom? When I think about leveraging uh, the mission. I think about a, a man named Don Castler. Don Castler was the very first funeral that I ever did here at the bridge. And I remember Don Castler, he was just this amazing guy, but, he, but by the time I got to know him, he was struggling pretty heavily with Parkinson's disease. And as we prepared his funeral and did the family meeting together, um, we're going through his obituary and we're trying to get everything in order and trying to figure out who he was and what he did and this, that, and the thing. And I heard story after story after story about Don the furnace man who loved Jesus. Don worked for pipelines and he worked for furnace com for, for uh, a HVAC company. And in both situations, a number of times he was used just to, sh he, he, just, he just shared the gospel with people and loved people. And he would get comments and, 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 and praise for how much he just cared for people when he showed up to their house. When I think of leveraging our positioning, I think about a guy named Leslie, really good friend of mine. Leslie uh, does uh, a lot of the movie theater show, the, the advertising for the movie theater here in town. And something that I know about Leslie is that Leslie's customers don't just see him as, a re, as, a, as someone who provides advertising for them. He sees them as a dear friend, and he has customers that every day he goes to see them, they just they cannot wait to get their hug from Leslie. Leslie's known for showing up to his customer's place, asking them how their lives are, ministering to them, and then praying before, for them before he leaves. Leslie's paying attention to his positioning. Listen, God wants to use you where you're at. But you have to be willing to step out. You have to pay attention to positioning and you have to say, whatever I'm good at, I'm gonna do it all for the glory of God and I'm gonna do it somewhere strategic for the mission of God. I'm gonna step into my calling vocation to call. God's placed you there for a reason. You might be sitting there wondering, ah, oh, there's got to be more. There is. There's so much more. So this is what we're going to do. I want you to just take a minute and bow your heads and close your eyes. To close the day, I just, I want us to take a minute and I want us to ask ourselves, what would happen if we all 
did this one small thing. What would happen if we all began to pay attention to our positioning? Where God's placed us, what the gifts that he's given us, the abundance that he's given us, and how can we leverage that for his kingdom? Take a minute and think about what our community would look like if we did that. How different our community would look if every single person in this church decided that they're gonna do every single thing they do out of the love of God in their hearts. That we might be a ministry, that we might understand that we're called. Imagine what Charles City would look like. Imagine how Floyd County would change, the landscape of Floyd County would change. Imagine the implications that would mean for our church and for churches across our town. If we all as Christians decided we're gonna own this calling and leverage it for him. Now I want you to imagine one last thing before we pray. What would it look like for you? How would it change your world? How would it change the way that you look at things? Father, we love you so much. And we are so undeserving of everything that you've given us and everything that you do, Lord. God, we're undeserving of this amazing church. I'm undeserving to be the pastor of this church, God. I, I can't believe we're plan A to reach the world. But God, I pray this morning that you would help us to pay attention to our positioning, that you would help us to see our calling, that you would help us to step out in courage, Lord. Courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the ability to overcome it, God. God, I, I know that you want to lay something specific on every single person's heart this morning, and so I just pray that they would be open and respond to that. That you would soften their hearts to your calling on their lives, because you've placed them in a specific position to reach a specific people for a specific reason. God, we love you. And we pray in expectation of you to use us as we step out in humility, in obedience, and in faith. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, I pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, if you haven't grabbed an Operation Christmas Child box or you still need, or you still need to turn yours in, uh, have them in by four. Otherwise, thank you for coming. Have an awesome week. God bless. Happy Thanksgiving.